Hey there, welcome to a brand new episode of Music Express. My name is Twan and in this week's vlog you will see my interview with no one else than Armin van Buren. I spoke with Armin about his classic communication, we spoke a little bit as well about his radio show A State of Trance and you will get to hear more about the brand new Gaia album. Enjoy! Armin van Buren is a DJ producer who was born on December 25th 1976 in Leiden, the Netherlands. When he was about 14 years old, he started with making music. He had his own little bedroom studio where he created his track Blue Fear back in the year 1997. Blue Fear became Armin's first successful track and it even entered the UK charts. But two years later, in 1999, Armin released his track Communication, which made it to the number 18 position in the UK singles charts. Because of the 20th anniversary of Communication, I sat down with Armin to talk with him about the story behind this classic. My first question to him was what he did remember from the production process of the track. Uh, I remember making communication uh, at the end of April 99 uh, when my parents were celebrating their uh, marriage. They were married uh, I think 20 years or something and uh, there was a big party in our house uh, but I just bought the Axis Virus A and I was uh, uh, fiddling at home in my studio. Uh, I came up with the melody for communication and uh, yeah, I was so excited about it I didn't actually join the party which upset my mother a little bit. Uh, but at the time uh, I was mainly producing house music or, or the club sounds because that was the most popular sound in the Netherlands at the time. There was no DJ Mag or it just it was just born. Uh, there, there was no signs of DJing, uh, Dutch DJs playing anywhere else. Uh, I think Chesto and Ferry were still on the rise and uh, you know trance was getting more and more popular but it was more like club trance that was popular. And I always, um, secretly I was producing some underground tracks as uh, with really weird names like Hyperdrive Inc. And, and stuff like that. And of course I created Blue Fear when, uh, you know, uh, before it was called Trance, I think. Uh, tracks like X Marks the Spot, because I always liked that trancey sound. And uh, I wanted to make a follow-up to Blue Fear for Cyber Records, because Blue Fear was such a big success. And uh, uh, yeah, I've always dreamed of making a follow-up. So I think the, the track was made actually pretty fast. It was done in like two days or something, yeah. What inspired you when you were working on a communication? What inspired me uh, when I was making communication was uh, I was listening a lot to the Speedy J albums at the time, uh, Ginger. And uh, yeah, I was a big fan of uh, Vangelis and Jean-Michel Jarre and stuff like that. And trance was, it was not set in stone yet, you know. Uh, of course you had the club trance and, uh, but the big hits, I mean, I think Ferry just released Out of the Blue. Uh, and I think it was about the time that Guriella came out, but it, it was just, th those tracks were relatively new at the time. Uh, I, I always loved uh, Vera Corcia, Carte Blanche, it had the piano of course, and I love pianos, so uh, yeah, I was really blown away by that track. Uh, and uh, yeah, I wanted to create something like that, um, and I never knew if I could, so I was just trying in the studio. Uh, and I created the track and I remember I was really proud of it, but I never expected it to be this much of a success. <laughs> And which part of the song took you the longest to work on? The bass line of the song uh, in the first version of Communication took a lot of time because it came from the Roland JV 1080 uh, or 2080, uh, which was uh, very difficult. You had to edit all the sounds in, in little menus and stuff like that. But I didn't have enough money to buy a lot of synths, so uh, my gear was basically uh, the Roland TR909, the Axis Virus A, I had a uh, Apple G3 Mac. Uh, with one of the first versions of Logic uh, to, to use it. Uh, and I used the, the 2080, uh, Roland 2080 for the bass line. Uh, I had a Supernova, I think, uh, from Novation, and an old uh, JXP uh, 3 synth from my dad, and a couple of other smaller things, but nothing major. And I, uh, I used the Akai samplers a lot, so all the drum sounds you hear are mainly from uh, the Akai, I think it was the S5000 sampler, yeah. Do you still have some of the old equipment? I still have I still have most of my old equipment. Yeah, I uh, I never thought it would be any value, so I just kept it. You know, it's in my attic somewhere. Uh, later, I bought the Virus C, the Virus Ti, uh, but uh, I used the Virus a lot because it just had a different sound and. Uh, uh, I, I didn't use I didn't use the uh, JP8000, which was you know considered to be one of the you know the classic trans synths, and I, I love it. I have I have the 8080 in my attic somewhere, uh, but I was always more of a virus fan in, in those days. So besides yourself, who was the first person to hear the track when it was finished? Uh, the first person to hear the track was obviously uh, uh, my parents because I was still living in my parents' house. 
And uh, Johan from Cyber Records, I sent it to him as a follow-up to, uh, to Blue Fear. And a couple of my best friends, um, I remember taking the bus, because uh, I didn't have a car when I, uh, I didn't have my own car yet. Uh, I remember taking the, uh, the bus to uh, Cyber Records in Leiden and uh, giving the, the demo to uh, Johan from Cyber and uh, yeah, he, was, he was really blown away by it. I think I went to his house, that was it. He was living in a house in Leiden Dorp and um, yeah, I went to his house and, and he had uh, goosebumps and I was so stunned that he liked it because it was a very personal track because it had the sounds that I loved but I, I thought that nobody liked those sounds, you know. <laughs> Communication became a big hit in the summer of 1999 on Ibiza. Do you remember which DJ supported the track back then? I think Judge Jules and Pete Tong both played Communication and then there was some sort of a bidding war going on uh, between uh, a couple of labels that wanted to sign it, uh, like Extravaganza and uh, AMPM. Uh, but I, I didn't even know what licensing meant at the time. You know, I was, I was really blue in that sense. I was just like, Johan was keeping me up to date. He was working with lawyers and stuff to, for the deal. And I was like, whoa, oh, I'm, I'm just glad everybody likes the song, you know? Uh, I think uh, Ferry started playing it. Uh, Chester wanted to include it on his compilation. And he also included it another track that I signed to another label as a Dark Star, uh, See Me, Feel Me. Uh, later uh, had to change the name to Rising Star because the name Dark Star was already taken. Um, yeah, and quickly after I made communication, uh, Chester was on the phone. Uh, he wanted to uh, do a track together, which we did later as Major League and as Alibi. So, communication peaked at the number 18 position of the UK single chart as well. Did you expect it to be such a success? No, I, I didn't think that an instrumental trance track would, would, would be in a single chart in the UK. It was completely unthinkable. It was a really weird experience, but it was really cool because coincidentally uh, it was my brother's birthday, the 5th of February 2000. It was the day that Communication came out or was released by AMPM. Uh, it was on uh, A Rotation, I think, or B Rotation on the BBC Radio 1. And it was the first gig I ever did in the UK in the courtyard uh, at Cream in Liverpool. Uh, and uh, I was warming up for Sepp Fontaine and I still remember to this day that Sepp gave me an extra 30 minutes because the crowd was going so crazy and they loved it so much and that was my first real gig in the UK and uh, yeah I still consider that to be one of my first gigs. Before that I already did some other gigs in Japan and Norway but uh, yeah I remember it to this day that yeah, it was an incredible gig. Communication is 20 years old now. There also has been a Communication Part 2, which came out in the year 2000, just a year after the original release. Why did you decide to make a new version not so long after the original 1999 version? I uh, was uh, playing a lot in these days, uh, especially after Communication. It was some sort of uh, some sort of a slipstream. I mean, uh, Ferry was super popular in the UK, and uh, the trend sound was really hot. And uh, I got to warm up and or play after Ferry a few times. He really helped me in the beginning of my career. And uh, I'm still thankful for that. And uh, he, uh, yeah, I was uh, at one point I was getting sick of my own track, so I just wanted to make another version. Uh, so I made one I did, that I pressed on an acetate, uh, just so I could play communication twice in my set, one time the original and one time as a sort of an encore, but have the, the string intro uh, that I played from the acetate. And then uh, Cyber Records said, we love it so much, we want to release it as well. So I said, well, okay, well, here you go. You know, it was just not something that was meant. So I made, named it part two because uh, that was the same thing as uh, Jean-Michel Jarre did with his Oxygen album, you know, Oxygen part one, part two. So it's like, you know, communication part one, part two. And then I made a uh, part three uh, right before I had a really important gig in Londonderry for Radio One in 2004. Uh, and I needed an updated version because the trans sound at the time was changing a lot and uh, when I mix communication you have to understand it's completely weird now but nowadays you mix everything in the box you know everything is in one DAW whether it's Ableton or Logic or FL Studio but back in the day when I made communication I just had one big mixer it was a ghost mixer, a 32 channel mixer, and there was a compressor at the end and a DAT machine. So, and then there was all these synths triggered by MIDI were coming into the mixer. That's how I made most of my track back in the day. And I, I worked like that till 2005. So uh, yeah, my, I felt that communication quickly sounded a bit dated. Not be because it sounded bad, but just because the other tracks that I played around it had much more harder kick. Uh, so I just took the MIDI parts from Communication and made a part three just so I could keep playing Communication because everybody was asking me to play Communication in my sets. So that's why I updated it in 2004. 
So after part two and part three, do you think we can expect a part four of communication because of the 20th anniversary? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe the 25th anniversary, I don't know, I, I just feel like communication is one of my babies, but, you know, she's grown now, she's grown up. <laughs> there have been quite a few remixes of the track, for example from Vincent de Moor, Ben Liebrand and Paul Oakenfold, to name a few. Yeah. Do you choose the remixers yourself? Uh, some of the remixes I chose myself, yeah, I was always a big fan of Vincent de Moor, I think he did an amazing mix. I, I'm still a bit sad that he stopped making music, because Vincent... You know, he's one of the giants and uh, yeah, I was a big fan of him. So yeah, I was super happy that we could commission him when uh, Combined Forces was releasing uh, the, the track. Um, but uh, yeah, Ben Liebrand wanted to do it one of his own because, you know, it, it was really like the Jedi Master, the Obi-Wan Kenobi was, was, was me mix, remixing his, uh, his Apprentice. That's how it felt, so I'm still honored that he actually took a shot at it. Uh, Paul Okafold, of course, is, is you know is probably one of the reasons why we all are here because he's the the godfather of all the DJs or trans DJs because you know he basically was the first one to do stuff like that and uh, yeah so for him to do a mix like that was was incredible honor. If you have to pick one, which version of communication would be your favorite one? I think the first version is still my favorite one simply because of the nostalgia. Uh, it's really hard to describe or to tell in this interview why the magic happens sometimes you know you can sit in the studio for days and, and, and nothing happens and then all of a sudden you walk into your studio and in, in, in half an hour you write a melody like that and, and, and the magic why or, or why something like that happened I still don't understand it's after communication I have to be honest I was having a massive writer's block as well because I couldn't come up with a follow-up because I just wanted to, uh, to achieve the same success. It took me a long time to find my way back into the studio and to create something like, you know, when I was ready for the album 76, it took me like two years because I, I had a writer's block after communication because everybody was expecting me to do some sort of a follow-up and I just couldn't, you know. We are here in the State of Trance radio studio. Um, you were one of the first DJs with a weekly radio show dedicated to trance music. Is it easier now for you to do the radio show compared to back in the day when you just started with making radio? Well, it was very weird when I first started doing a radio show because uh, I remember a lot of my colleagues said I was completely crazy for doing a two hour radio show every week, every week. <laughs> But I always promised myself as a little kid, because uh, when I was driving my bike to school, uh, every, every week was a half hour commute or 45 minutes commute. And I taped all the, the dance radio shows in the Netherlands because I wasn't old enough to go clubbing myself. And uh, yeah, it was really funny. Actually, I got my education on the bike, right, riding my bike to school. And I, I just knew that radio was so powerful. It was the only way to actually communicate with your fans, com communication. And uh, so when I got the opportunity to start my own radio show in June 2001, I immediately said yes, because I knew that that was what I always wanted to do, uh, whether I made money with it or not. And actually looking in hindsight, it was a smart move, but at the time I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Um, I did the show in Dutch, it was only on cable radio, it was not on the internet, but some guys in the north of the Netherlands, uh, I still owe them a beer, uh, they started streaming my radio show on Shoutcast or something, one of the first streaming protocols on the internet. This is way before any streaming on the internet. And uh, uh, I remember something that I ha was touring with Gatecrasher or God's Kitchen, uh, and I did my radio show on Thursday, and I flew to New Zealand for the start of a tour. And I was in Auckland, in the St. James Theatre, and there was a guy holding up a sign in the crowd of a track that I just had the acetate from, from, I think it was Dick de Groot, uh, the a &R manager of High Contrast Recordings. Uh, he, he gave me the acetate, so the, the person could have only heard that track on my radio show. That's when I started to understand, like, wait a minute, radio could be a really smart thing to do. Because actually, uh, I started Armada Music also on the back of the success of the radio show, because all of a sudden, all these trans producers were coming to my radio studio every week to give me their demos to play on the show. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, you know, and I got all these great demos by Mark Olten and Robert Nixon and, uh, you know, a later motorcycle by Dave Dresden. They were just demos that were handed to me. And, and, I, and I told Michael, like, I want to release it. But so he said, well, we should start a label and, and start together. So that's thanks to the radio show. It's thanks to the State of Trance and thanks to the fans because 
especially in the early days. I remember it was kind of cool that I presented it in Dutch, because I remember when I was fired from the Slam FM uh, radio uh, show station, I had to go to New York to the DIFM guys, or uh, first it was another uh, radios. I can't remember exactly. But uh, I started to do the radio show in English, and I saw that some English people were disappointed because they liked the Dutch radio, the language so much. <laughs> which was really funny. I also remember to this day that uh, I was doing the show and I, was, I had a, this really amateuristic website and I, I posted the playlist there every week, which at the time was very new because everything was, was white label. You know, at the time we were spinning vinyl, we were not spinning CDs and everybody used to, to, to put a sticker on the, on the label so nobody could see. Sometimes you could play a track for half a year without somebody knowing what it was. And nowadays it's completely different, of course, because we have Shazam and everybody's telling the titles. But I was publishing the, the track list of my, uh, of my radio show every week on my website. And I remember reaching episode 52 and I remember having a discussion on IRC chat with people saying, like, should I go to year two, episode one, or should I keep continuing counting? And then somebody said, no, just say episode 53 and 54 and 55. So that's how I started counting the, the numbers. And then when we reached episode 100, I asked uh, somebody at id and uh, if I could do a beach party, because it coincidentally happened to be a very uh, sunny weekend. And that's how we ce celebrated the first episode 100, the first big celebration. Uh, because the, the guys from IDT also owned uh, uh, the beach uh, place where we did the party. So that was the first state of trance party. And now, you know, we have this massive event every year in Utrecht. But it just all came from, you know, just the passion of doing it and, and the fun, which is still what I do every week. I got to be honest, though, I, I'm very happy that we have the radio studio. Not so much because we're with video as well, but also because I, now I'm doing the show again live and I'm not staring at an Ableton screen, you know, and I just hear the beginning and ending of every track, but I have to play all the tracks live. Sometimes I make little mistakes and I think people like to see uh, this kind of dynamic and I'm having so much more fun as well because I come to the office every week. Uh, after the two hour show, I'm done. I don't have to do liners anymore or the mix is what it is. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm meeting all my uh, friends again. You know, everybody comes to the studio to play the new tracks and to discuss music. I mean, I can literally say I go to work every day uh, to play music, which uh, I think is a big honor. Earlier this year, you celebrated the 900th edition of A State of Trends. So that means that episode 1000 is coming up in less than two years. Any plans for that one already? Yeah, we're, we're making plans for episode 1000. Of course, ex everybody expects me to go to the moon, so... Uh, no, we're having uh, we're having big big plans right now. Uh, the episode 1000 date will probably be the 21st of January 2021. So 2101, 21. That's weird. One two one two two one two. Uh, so that's uh, and we, of course we have to do something special. So probably be a world tour, of course. Uh, I, I can't tell you which dates net. I can't tell you which the theme will be, but of course we're going to do something big. Uh, also, what I can tell you is I'm, I plan to give back uh, because you know we received so much love from the fans all around uh, the world for all these years. Uh, so I'm working with the charity organization right now. We're signing contracts, so uh, part of the uh, show will be charity, uh, giving back uh, to the earth and giving back to yeah the people. Because I want the state of trance to make the world a little better, hopefully. <laughs> You're active in the scene for many years already and you worked with plenty of famous people from producers to singers and songwriters. A few years ago you had the chance to work with Jean-Michel Jarre. How was it to work with your childhood hero? I was, uh, I was really in awe to meet Jean-Michel Jarre first and foremost. He's not only a really talented musician and one of the people that started this whole thing, uh, because you could call him the pioneer of trance because he was one of the first guys to actually use the synthesizer. Um, and I think it's very important to understand the history of the synthesizer. I mean, right now, every track you hear on the radio has an electronically produced background. But at the time when Jean-Michel Jarre made his first synthesizer albums, the synthesizer was considered to be a devilish instrument made by some nerds in some office. Um, little did we know that the synthesizer would be the basis of what we now call EDM or dance music or whatever you want to call it. So to work with Jean-Michel Jarre, one of the founders, one of the first guys that actually had the balls to use the instrument in a musical way and sell millions of albums, yeah, it was incredible. And he actually was a fan of me and I couldn't believe it because I have all his albums. I was a little, hey, I'm a little fanboy. So to work with, with Jean-Michel Jarre on his uh, Electronica album was probably one of the highlights of my career. And uh, 
I remember the first track actually being rejected. He didn't like the first idea that I had. And I went on my skiing holiday and I was so upset that he didn't like it that when I got back, I immediately had another idea, put it in, and that's the one that became Stardust. Because I wanted the track to happen so bad. And uh, I was also really blown away by how critical he was and how good he knew what he was doing. Because he was so particular about uh, certain sections in the song and little little sounds that I mean I think the uh, the, uh, the final version of the track is so full of details it was a project of something like a hundred tracks for an instrumental song it was incredible okay something else I'm sure you get this question in every recent interview but can you tell us something more already about the upcoming Gaia album uh, the Gaia album is probably the most personal album I've ever done uh, it's another planet in the universe of Armin van Buren uh, it's something that uh, we've done in a completely different way. I created it together with Benno de Goei, who I produce a lot with together. And uh, we did it completely the other way around. Uh, normally you would go into the studio to create music, and then you would create an album, and then you would go on tour. Now we first went on tour and then created the album. Uh, we actually road tested the, the loops that we used for uh, the, the album. Uh, so the loops are the moons. And uh, it w we, for a long time, we didn't have any tracks. We just had loops. So basically what the Gaia album is, is a journey through all the, the satellites of Jupiter. You know, if, if, you, could, if you could have a journey to the, uh, next to the moons of Jupiter, what would it sound like? And that this is our interpretation of that. And it's uh, probably one of the albums I'm most proud of of my entire career. It's very personal. I think it will be very a shock to somebody because it's a little departure from the previous Gaia sound. Uh, having said that though, there's a lot of melodies and there's a lot of trancey stuff on there, but um, we, did, we made it without any compromise, so it was just Benno I had to answer to. Uh, so there's nobody at Armada that a and did, there's nobody that said anything about the album. Uh, it's just Benno and myself in the studio, and that's it. This is what we wanted to make. No collaborations, no remixes, no vocal tracks, no snare fills, no crashes. In fact, just one uh, synthesizer that we used. One soft synth. One. I'm not kidding. And it, it was so such a breath of fresh air to approach the same thing that I've been doing for more than 20 years uh, from a more uh, creative point of view. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed making it. And it's probably one of the albums I'm, I'll be most proud of forever. Uh, I don't know if, if people will actually dig it, but in a way it doesn't really matter because this is the album that, I me, mean, Benno said it the best way. He called me up the other day and we were working on it remotely because I was touring. And he said, I have to release this album before I die. And I said, that's exactly my feeling. I want to release this album because it is the most personal. And forget any, we were not, we were not trying to be trans or non-trans. We were not trying to be techno or non-techno. We were just making the music that comes straight from Armin and Benno you know, when they were 18 years old. Uh, and it's also a little monument for our heroes. Uh, our heroes, you know, Kraftwerk, uh, Daft Punk, Jean-Michel Jarre, Klaus Schulze, very important. Uh, you know, carbon-based life forms, Shoot Your Son of London, Speedy J. Uh, it's a little monument for them. Sven Vath, uh, Chris Liebing, uh, yeah, the list is long. <laughs> what else are you working on right now? Uh, well, we're always working on the Gaia, uh, Gaia stuff because uh, the album, The Moons of Jupiter, contains 21 uh, tracks, but uh, there are 67 satellites for Jupiter. Uh, I'm also working on my new artist album as Armin van Buren, and I uh, have a lot of tracks ready for that already. Uh, actually, a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, yeah, still so much more to, to, to finish. Uh, a, a lot of upcoming singles, and I'm just working with everybody right now, you know. Recently, I've really been veering out by, for example, working with Vini Vici, or then working with Fernando Gary Bay, or, or working with Bonnie McKee, or, or with Sam Martin. I just want to have fun. I even did a track in Dutch language, which probably I would have never done five or 10 years ago, but I just feel free in the studio right now. And I've, I had a little rough time with accepting who I am, because I'm, I'm not uh, Ferry Corsten, I'm not uh, Carl Cox, I'm, I am Armin van Buren. And, this is who I am. I like to work on, on different projects all the time. And this is what you'll see me done, do in the future as well. My heart will always be with trance, always and forever, because that's where I come from. And this is the sound I still listen every day that I wake up to, but it needs to move on. You know, As proud as I am on, of communication, for example, I will never make another communication because 
uh, I need to move on and keep it exciting. I have all the settings for communication. I have the equipment. I, I probably know how to make a follow-up, but if I would use the same riff and the same piano, I mean, I've been there, you know? Uh, and I'm proud of it, of course. The same thing as uh, This Is What It Feels Like or In and Out Of Love or, or my track with Ferry, Exhale. Or, I'm, I'm very still very proud. I wouldn't change a single note about these tracks, but you know, as a person, as, as a musician, I always want to move on and look for the next exciting project. Thank you very much for your time and good luck with everything. Thank you very much. All right, that was it, this week's vlog, my interview with Armin van Buren. Armin, thank you very much for your time, much appreciated. Thank you guys for watching, I hope you enjoyed the vlog. If you did, make sure to give this video a like, leave a comment in the comment section below, and in case you didn't already, make sure to subscribe. If you're new to my channel, I have plenty of other interviews online as well, with people such as Ferry Korsten, Chicane, Solar Stone, Sander Kleinenberg, Gabriel and Dresden, uh, Mike Push, The Thrill Seekers, and the list goes on and on. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, bye bye.